Uh, last week, I, I feel like the Lord wants me to continue what we were talking about last week. Uh, there's a, a more to say on, on, on the topic, and so I just want to just, I know we've been praying, but just indulge me. I just want to pray uh, just for a moment. Father, I just pray that you would just uh, anoint this word that, that, uh, that you've asked me to share uh, tonight. Lord, uh, uh, you know that uh, on my own, Lord, I can't convince or persuade anybody. You know my, my talent level. You know where I am, Lord. But God, I give all that I am to you as I am, Lord, and Holy Spirit, I ask that you would just um, offer myself as a vessel, Lord. I want to be a witness of your goodness, of your glory. I know the amazing, wonderful things that you are doing in my life, Father, and I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful for the freedom. I'm so grateful for your Holy Spirit. I'm so grateful for the revelations that you have given me. And Lord, I just desire with all of my heart to be able to communicate it to the people of this church, Lord. It's the desire of my heart they would just be able to see that what, what, you've, what you've shown me, Lord. So I pray that you would just help me to, with the words that I'm saying to, to communicate uh, this heart to them. And Lord, that you would just set people free, Lord, that you'd open up our minds. You'd set people from depression and anxiety and worry and fear that, we, that you would set us free from medicating with all different forms of addictions, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would just make us aware of your Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us and the freedom that comes from a relationship with you. And Lord, I pray you just open up our eyes, Lord. Lord, you love us so much, and I pray you would pour out your love on this place this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. John 10.10 10 says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I've come to give you life and to give it abundantly. I, I love that phrase. We've opened up every single uh, 911 message with that verse and also on the, the radio and the podcast as well because it just speaks to me with, with where we are as a people, as a church in the United States of America there is a thief right now that is, that is trying to steal, kill, and destroy our lives. He's been active for thousands of years. And in our culture, it's something so different than other nations. Other nations, we're seeing more people get saved than ever before. We're also seeing more people be martyred for their faith than ever before. Revival is happening in all over the nation, all over the world right now. In China right now, revival is happening. People are being saved daily, hourly, but people are also being killed for their faith. You know, in other, the Muslim countries, people are getting saved uh, uh, left, left and right. There, there's a move of God in Iran right now. There's, you don't hear about it on the news, but there is a revival taking place in the nation of Iran right now. People are being saved, but people are also being imprisoned and martyred in the name of Jesus. In our nation, we can say, well, none of those things are happening. We're not, we're not under that same type of a spiritual or religious oppression that we see in other countries. But there's a different prince over our nation, and it's a lot more... You can put that down for now. We'll hit it afterwards. So it's, yeah. There's, there's, a lot, there's a, something a lot more subtle happening, happening in our nation. It's, it's like a, a python that's just slowly wrapping around the people and just squeezing ever so slightly just getting tighter and tighter until we become numb of the condition of where we're at. And I believe that God wants to awaken the church in the United States of America up to our condition, but also to the reality of the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us. And we, we know that phrase, and we, we say it, and we, we believe it in our mind, but to truly believe that if I am a born-again Christian, if I put my faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of me. And so we're going we to tackle that, that, that verse uh, again that we talked about last week. If you have your Bibles, um, it's in John chapter 15. And I think this just portrays so beautifully what God wants to do in our lives. Jesus is talking, he says... Uh, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener, or the vine dresser. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. 
No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is, this is to my Father's glory, and you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be complete and your joy may be complete. And we're going to pause there for, 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 one, for one moment. So just, just recap what we talked about last week. You know, Jesus is the, is the true vine. And Gina, thank you for jumping on that camera. I appreciate it. That Jesus is the, is the, true, the true vine. And, and we are branches that are grafted into the true vine, which is Jesus. When we put our faith in God, the Bible says that we are, we are connected to the true vine. The Holy Spirit is the lifeblood of the vine. It flows from the vine into the branch, which is us. And if it flows uninterruptedly, that branch bears much fruit. Now, a gardener or a vine dresser, their job is to take care of the branch, take care of the vine, to prune the branches in order to allow the branch to bear more fruit. And this is the whole, the whole goal here of what God is doing, is for us to bear fruit. And that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, it says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. I think I got it. Most of them in there. But, but if you really want to say what the fruit of the Spirit is, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Every other word that comes after it is a description of love. God wants us to bear love. And so as the Holy Spirit flows into us uninterrupted, we begin to bear more fruit, which is God's love. You with me? Okay, and so this, so this is a beautiful thing when we, when we realize this. We try so often to, to do things in our own strength or we try to, to have godly characteristics because the Bible teaches that, and so we try to discipline ourselves to, to certain types of behavior. But this is not what Jesus is teaching. Jesus is teaching us to remain in him, to abide in him, to be connected to him, to be aware of his presence in our lives, to fully surrender ourselves to him. That's what he talks about in scripture when he says, if you, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. You'll do what I say. Doing what he says is surrender. He wants us to surrender our lives. Just like we talked about a few weeks ago, when we make Jesus the Lord of our life, he becomes our king. But he, wants, he needs to be an absolute monarch, a ruler over our lives, if we're going to live a free, victorious life. When we try to make our own choices, when we try to have good morals, when we try to live by our, our own code of morality, or even the Bible's code of morality, we're going to fall short. God didn't call us to decide what is good and evil. That was the original sin. I mean, man decided, hey, you know, I'm going to try this fruit, and I'm going to determine what is good and what is bad. That's not what we're supposed to do. We're not do deciding what's good and bad. We're supposed to submit and be obedient to God. When God says do it, we do it. When God says think it, we think it. When God says believe this, that's what we're supposed to believe. And so, so, so we want to remain in him, to surrender to him. And we can't allow ourselves to be, you know, we talked about being the prime minister of our life. You know, in, in England, you know, they have, they have the, the Queen Elizabeth and all the royalty that happens, and it's very romantic for Americans. We like to look at the magazines and, and, and get all, all into it. I don't know why, but, you know, we, we got away from that for a reason, but yet we still, ro <laughs> we ro you know, we, we dream about it. And, um, but anyways, the prime minister, you know, is in charge of the country and the parliament. And, and the, the queen is just a figurehead. And so too often, that's what we do. God becomes a figurehead in our life. We love him. We want the ticket to go to heaven. We say the prayer. You know, we want to do a couple good deeds. And, but that's not what he's looking for. 
true freedom doesn't come from that way. When we try to live that, that way, we just mess it up. You know? And that's why we struggle with the insecurity, with the fear, with the depression, with the freedom, with the anxiety, with all those different things that we struggle with, that we medicate with all kinds of different things. We, those are from not surrendering our lives to the Lord. You know, when we have thunderstorms at my house, uh, when the kids were little, I was talking to Caitlin about this uh, the other day we were talking about with worship. You know, my kids would come running down the, well, running down the stairs. Yeah, we, we lived underneath them, and they're all upstairs. They'd run down the stairs, and they'd hop into our beds, and they'd get under the covers, you know, and they, they would find that, that, safe, that safe place. You know what I'm saying? You know, and they, they weren't worried about what was happening around them when they were with us in our bed under the covers. They felt safe. And that's the kind of relationship that God wants us to have with him. Not trying to figure it out on our own, but finding that place of surrender and that safety uh, with him. Now, I want to just pause the message for a second and tell you a little story. It'll come back to the message. But my wife and I, we're at our anniversary is tomorrow. Yes, we're going to be married 21 years tomorrow. Kelly is a very patient woman. <laughs> so we've been married 21 years, and we went on this, we went, actually, we went out uh, last night. Our lives have been like crazy the last couple of weeks with all the kids' activities and Gavin being in the Sound of Music and, and all everybody else's stuff happening. It's been really crazy. And so we finally had a moment last night, and it was actually Tyler's birthday also, and Tyler, so Kate, Tyler came over to our house, and Caitlin cooked him dinner, so that was really sweet, and and so we said, well, if Caitlin and Tyler, if you're hanging out here at the house, we're leaving. You know, you watch the kids. Happy birthday, Tyler. You know, <laughs> watch the kids. <laughs> we're, we're, we're going out. And uh, so we went to the, to the Wayside Inn, and, and it was great because there was, there was nobody there. We had our own private, you know, escort. He brought us down. It was actually the, the groundskeeper. He was filling in for the hostess or whatever. So he was a hoot. That was the, I wish he would do it all the time. He was great. So he brought us down. We got into one of the little rooms. We were by ourselves a whole night, you know, and, and our waitress was great. We had, she was, she was laughing because we were ordering the same food. I said, when you start marrying, been married 21 years, you're, you just start to like the same things. And, and saying all this to say that we had a, we had a wonderful time. And, and I love my wife. I love spending time with her. It's not just that I love to be married and I, and I love her. I love being around her. I love spending time with her. I love to talk to her, and, and, and I love for her to talk to me. You know, it's uh, not trying to be too mushy here, but, uh, uh, but I'm, I, I, I adore my wife, and, and I love her so much. And I hope that God blesses us with another 21 years plus, you know, just so that we can be married, and, and so I can get to know her even better and love her even more. And as much as I love my relationship with my wife, the love that we should have for God and the love that God has for us is so much greater, you know? And I, I mean, I, I, I adore my wife. Our love for God and his love for us is so much greater. And so when he talks about these words, it's, it's, it's such a, a nice thing when he says, you know, to, to, to abide in him, to... to to have that, that connection. See, the, the, the problem that we have and the reason we don't have victory in our lives is because God's this person we go to when we have a need, when we have a situation. He's the person that we learn about in church to learn how to be a better person. You know what I'm saying? But he is, our, is he our everything? You know, are we doing what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5? Are we rejoicing always and praying without ceasing and in all things giving thanks? You know, are, are we living our lives that way? In this verse here, and we'll get to the second half in, in a second, but he says, um, uh, I lost the part here. Well, I can't even find it. That's crazy. It's disappearing from me. Well, I know what it says. I'll tell you. He, say, he says, basically says, you know, if you, if you abide in him and he abides in you, ask whatever you want and he'll, he'll give it to you. All right? And... So there's some, there's some language that's happening here. 
This verse right here, this is a parallel to the greatest commandment. You guys know what that is? The greatest commandment is to love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. This is what Jesus is talking about right here. This is the how do I love God with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my strength. I'm going to remain in him. I'm going to abide with him. I'm going to be with him always. And then when I pray, so what am I, how, what am I praying here? That, that he, I'm going to ask whatever he wants and, and he's going to give it to me. In, in, in Matthew chapter 5, no, excuse me, Matthew chapter 7, um, uh, he's going through the Sermon of the Mount through 5, 6, and 7. And in Matthew chapter 7, you know, Jesus says that. He says, ask and it'll be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. You know, and he talks about how uh, our fathers like us who are evil compared to God give good gifts. How, how much better gifts will God give? But, I, but in Luke, in Luke chapter 14, he says it, it's said slightly different. And I, and, and I think sometimes we, we, when we think about the good gifts, we're thinking about, I'm going to pray for God for a raise. I'm going to pray for a new car. I'm going to, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to pray for this thing that's going to make my life more comfortable. This is not what he's saying. In Luke chapter 14, he says, At, the, the good gift is, he says, ask, won't, the, won't God, your, your Father, give you the gift of the Holy Spirit? This is the good gift that he's going to give us. This is the gift that we should be seeking. Now, Paul calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of adoption. And so when we put our faith in Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us, he is the spirit of adoption. He is constantly giving glory to the Father. He is revealing the Father to us, that we are actually in God's family. He's adopted us, and we are his kids. We are in his family. And to, to begin to develop that relationship with him. And we can go under the covers when we need to. Now, so in this prayer, in both in Luke um, 6 and in and, excuse me, Luke 14 and Matthew 6, you know, Jesus says, you know, pray like this. You know, our Father in heaven, you know, hallowed be your name. You know, your kingdom come, your will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us of our debts or our trespasses as we've forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And he says, this is how you pray. He says, listen, your father already knows what you need before you ask. So he, don't, don't keep babbling so many words. He says afterwards, don't worry, don't worry so, mu so much. Doesn't God um, you know, clothe the, the, the grass and the, the flowers in the field and, and feeds the birds of the air? I mean, he takes care of all the little things in nature. Won't he take care of you? He says, your father already knows what you need. So, if I, if, so when we say this kind of prayer, he says, go into your room, close the door, and, 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 and your father will, will hear you when you come to him in secret. And so this is like a special place. I like uh, Robert Henderson calls it the, the, the secret place. And so we step into that, that secret place of prayer. And this is loving God with all of our heart. All this ties in together. But when we, when we enter that, that place of prayer, our, our prayer is not about, God, I, I need you to do this. He knows it already. You know? God, I need you to do this. I, he knows it already. You know, I know that my kids need new shoes, they need new, new, new clothes, you know? I know that I need to give them dinner, you know? I, I know that, and he's a much better father than I am. But what we should be seeking, God, what's the most important thing that we could possibly have in our life is the Holy Spirit. And so he says, man, ask for the Holy Spirit. Seek the Holy Spirit. You know, knock on the door that, that the Holy Spirit, would, would, you'd receive that gift. And then with that gift, to become aware of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because when we become aware of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of adoption, within our lives, it allows us to connect with God all the time. And then we're not worried about what's happening over here, what's happening over here, this need, that need. I know that my Father's going to provide for me because he gave me the spirit of adoption. He deposited it in me. You understand what I'm saying? You know, and so he, he's, he's given that. And so this, this type of prayer here in, um, uh, that he's saying to, to pray here in uh, John 15, he's saying, listen, Ask for that Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what is going to flow through the vine into the branch, which is what's going to allow you to bear more fruit. And bearing fruit is what being a Christian is all about. Bearing the fruit of the Spirit, bearing the fruit of love. Now, why is bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit so important? Well, for two reasons. One, it allows us to connect with the Father. 
we're able to connect with his love, all right? And number two, it allows us to love other people, all right? So let's, we're going to continue here in verse 12, uh, John 15, verse 12. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you did what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. And this is a different kind of prayer. We may hit on it tonight. He says, this is my command, love each other. And so we are to bear the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, and it manifests in joy, peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness. And we think about this for a second, on how we, we, we relate to other people. You know, when I, when I sit down and I think about the things that God has forgiven me for, and you know what you've done. I know what I've done. And not just the things that I've done that people would say, oh, that's terrible. But I know the, the motives in my heart. I know the intentions that I have, even the ones that I hate. I know what's deep down dark inside of me. And I know God's long-suffering with me throughout my life. I, I can, I, how he's navigated me and and how he's been patient. Long-suffering is the same thing as patience. You know, how he's been patient with me and kind to me and gentle with me. And even when he pulled me out of certain situations and I'm like kicking and screaming, God, why are you doing this to me? It was all because of his goodness and his gentleness to take care of me. Now, if God treats me that way, and we're supposed to bear the fruit of the Spirit, how do we treat other people? Are we long-suffering with them? Or when someone does something, are we so quick to be like, oh my gosh, did you hear what brother so-and-so did? We should pray for them. You know what I mean? You know, we're so quick to, to judge. Oh my gosh, I can't believe that they, they did that or thought that or said that. You know, and we want to get other people involved because, you know, we want to pray for them. Instead of being like, hey, maybe pulling somebody aside by themselves. I'm not going to tell anybody, brother, but what's happening, but I want, to, I want to help you with what's going on in your life. I want you to find the freedom that I found in my life. This is just between me and you. Nobody else is going to know. You know what I'm saying? That kind of, that kind of love, that kind of forgiveness, that type of uh, restoration to, to, to love other people, to treat other people the way that Jesus treats us. You know, Jesus says here that there's no greater love than a man laid down his life for his friends. I mean, Jesus showed us the ultimate love when he died on the cross to forgive us of our sins so that we could receive the spirit of adoption, so that we could be in God's family. We think about the love that he showed even to the people that were nailing him to the cross, whipping his back and making him hang there and suffer. He still loved them. And he still forgave. But yet, how often, we think about our, think about our behavior sometimes and, and, and just the church in general and the way we're perceived by the rest of the world and how we put ourselves out there and how we, we say that we're hating sin, but does it come out as hating sin or does it come out as hating the sinner? I mean, I'm not going to poke fingers at anybody, but let's just be real for a minute. You know what I mean? You know, and, and, and have we engaged in that, that, that personally? Where somebody, what, what makes one sin to a point where it's like, oh my gosh, I, I mean, I can't be around that person. They did this. They do that. You know? What, may, what bring, elevates someone to the point where all of a sudden I can't go to them? I can't, I can't love on them. What that means is I need to bear more fruit. I might have enough fruit to, to, to deal with Miss Jones' problems because she don't have any, so... She's awesome. But, you know, but I, have, I, have that, I, only, I have that much fruit. But, man, I don't have enough fruit to deal with Caitlin. You know? So, so, what, so is the problem on Caitlin? I mean, she, she needs Jesus. <laughs> but there's a problem with me. 
Okay, and not that it's a problem that can't be fixed. I need to submit and surrender myself to the Father, who is the gardener, the vine dresser, to allow him to prune me so that I can bear more fruit and love people even deeper and help bring them to Jesus. Because that's why Jesus did it, was to help to bring us into God's family. We need to do the same thing, to bring people into God's family. So we need to check our hearts to make sure that we're not hating the sinner. Now let me tell you a story here. Um, in Luke chapter 10, yep, that's it, Luke chapter 10, this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. It says, on one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? The, the guy answers, the teacher answers, love the Lord God with all your heart, with all of your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Go do this and you will live. So the guy answered, answered right. He says, I'm supposed to love God and I'm supposed to love other people. He's basically saying, I'm going to do exactly what Jesus says in John 15. I'm going to abide in him. I'm going to allow his love to come through me. I'm going to love God. And I'm going to bear fruit so that I can love other people, show them Jesus so they can come to salvation. But this guy, he's just saying the right words. He had the, 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 the knowledge, the scriptures in his mind, but he didn't have the spirit of God there leading him because he tries to justify himself. He says in verse 29, it says in verse 29, but he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he fell into the hands of robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead, and, priest ha and a priest happened to, go, to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by to the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, Pass to the other side. So there's this man, this Jewish man, he's, he, he's beaten, he's bleeding, he's naked, he's lost everything, he's on the side of the road, almost dead. A priest who should have been the hero of the story comes up and sees the man and walks to the other side. Now, why does he do this? Well, I mean, in, in, um, in, in Jewish law, not, not Bible law, but you know, the man-made laws that they had added, you know, he couldn't go and touch that guy because the guy was getting ready to die. If he touched him, he'd be unclean, and, you know, he couldn't go to the temple. And now because of the dead body, that would be true. He would be unclean. But the greater thing to do would be to help the hurting man. And, but he doesn't do it. He goes to the other side. He wasn't able to help this man because he couldn't, he wasn't able to bear the fruit of love in his life. You know, he was, he was focused on, 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 on religion. He was focused on his understanding of, of Scripture. He saw this man, you know, as, as uh, someone to be avoided, you know, someone to stay away from. You know, we do that today with, with people of various, various groups, you know, and we want to, to stay away from that person because of the sin that they're involved in or the thing that they're doing, you know. But the problem is that we're not bearing enough fruit enough love. We need to abide in the vine more and allow the Father to prune us so that we can uh, have more love. And so the Levite does the same thing, walks to the other side. But then a Samaritan, and this would have gotten everybody's craw because the Samaritan were the enemy. So here the enemy comes up and the Samaritan was traveling, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, and so he walked, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and I will return. I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Then Jesus says here, which of these three do you think, this is the important words here, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of a robber, who was a neighbor. Jesus turned it around because the guy was asking, who is my neighbor? Who is my friend? 
And so he turns around and says, who do you think was the neighbor? Who was a friend? And the man, the expert of the law says, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. And so when we read in John chapter 15, and we're told to, uh, to abide in the vine, allow the Holy Spirit to flow through us so that we can bear the fruit of love, and it can manifest in multiple different ways. We're supposed to use this to love the Father, to come into that secret place, into his presence. But we're also supposed to be, to take that love and to love our friend. He says, greater love is this than a man lays down his life for a, for a friend. Was every single person a friend of Jesus when they were crucifying him on that cross? Heck no. It wasn't that they were his friends, so he was dying for them. Jesus was being a friend. He was being a neighbor and dying for the sins of the world. When we were in our darkest place, Jesus died for us. While we are still sinners, Romans 5, 8 says, that Christ died for us. He was being a friend. He was being a neighbor. And he's called us to act likewise. And so when he says here to go out and to uh, show love to our friends, he doesn't just mean the person sitting next to me, the people that I like to hang out with. He's saying, go and be that friend to someone else. That second type of prayer, he says, ask whatever you want, it'll be given to you. And he's speaking to the reference of friends. In John 14, when he, he's uh, sharing how to pray, he also gives another analogy. He says there's a friend and, uh, who had a friend who was going on a journey and needed some bread to travel. And so that friend had a friend who knew had supplies and went, on, went up to his house and started banging on the door. Said, hey, friend of mine, I've got a buddy, a friend over there that needs help. He's going on a journey. He needs some supplies. Can you help him? And the guy's like, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. My kids are in bed. What are you doing? Go away. And the, but the friend who was standing in the gap for the other friend, this is intercession now, was knocking on the door again. He just kept beating on it and kept beating on it until finally he was so persistent that the, that the guy with the supplies, the friend with the supplies, finally said, okay, you know what? Here, take it. <laughs> just let me go back to sleep. Take it and go give it to your other friend. This is what this type of prayer is. This is intercession where we stand in the gap for a friend. Our, we can't do anything about it. We don't have the resources. We don't have the grace. We don't have what it takes. But I have a friend who does. That friend is Jesus. And as I abide in that vine, I can ask him and say, can you help my friend? Now, I might be you know, interceding for one of you who I would consider my friends. But what about the person who I have no connection? I actually hate what they're doing. I can still intercede for that friend. It's not that they're my friend. It's that I'm being a friend for them. I'm calling on the king of heaven who has the resources and the ability to save and set that person free. I'm interceding, standing in the gap for that person and calling out to them to, to, for, for God to, to touch their lives, to set them free. And most people that are involved in certain lifestyles and certain addictions and things like that, that's just, that's just something that's masking something else. That's not the real issue, you guys. That is... That is what's covering up some deeper hurt that's inside someone's heart. And so God has called us, I believe, as a church, in this community, in this nation, to, to wake up, to not just do church like usual, to come in and get what we can get for us, that can get us through the week, so that we can you know, get through whatever's going on in our lives, and then come back again and get refilled up and do it all over again. God has called you to something so much more, something so much greater. And it's not about you. You say, well, I can't do that. Well, no, you can't. It's not, you, you can't do it. It's not about you. It's about you saying, I surrender myself to God. I love, there was a, 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 um, an evangelist, um, I don't know how long ago it was. Was she, she, Catherine Coleman, when did she minister? In the 60s, 70s, 50s? I, I don't know. But she ministered a while ago. I think she, anyway, I think she died in the 70s, right? The 70s? Yeah. So, but Catherine Coleman, and she was a healing evangelist. Uh, I actually have loads of respect for, for, for Catherine Coleman. 
But I, one of the things that you'll always hear her say, and any, whenever you read anything about her, is she said, I had no talent. I had nothing to offer God, nothing good inside of me. But Lord, if you can take nothing, I give it to you. And God used her powerfully. God wants to use you, my friends, to do something powerful for the kingdom of God. But we first have to awaken ourselves. We have to connect to the vine. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to flow through us. We have to begin to bear the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. We have to practice that love. When we practice that love by giving it to other people, by being forgiving and being patient and being kind, start with your best friend in real life or with your, your spouse. Start with them. You know, and then you can, then as you work on your spouse, then the father can continue to prune you and let you love somebody else. Then it'll become your coworker, you know, and then your boss, you know. You know what I'm saying? You know, just keep, 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 keep practicing. And God wants to use us to, to intercede for this community, for our families, for this nation. My friends, I'm telling you what, we, we have got, it's got to start with somebody. You know what I'm saying? You know, this nation is being, like, slowly choked, slowly poisoned, and just, you know, and, and, if, and, if, and it's not going to be done through politics and, and all of those things. I'm not saying that we, we shouldn't be involved in politics. I'm not saying that at all. Don't get me wrong. But I'm saying that the answer is going to come from a move of the Holy Spirit. You know, through, through people coming alive to the revelation of, of God in them. And beginning to operate in the kingdom instead of operating in their flesh. And as we begin to live our life that way, you know, we're, going to be, we're going to be able to make a difference in this nation. And so I just want to challenge you. I mean, Caitlin, come on up here, sweetie. We're going to, we're going to sing that song one, one more time that she sang last. And you can sing in your seat. You can come to the altar, whatever you want to do. But I want you just to take a, a first step. And that's all it is. Take a first step, and then when you go home tonight, take another one. When you wake up in the morning, take another one. Take a step and saying, Lord, here I am. Use me. You know the things that I struggle with. You know, if there's addictions in your life, if there's, you know, uh, some kind of spiritual oppression in your life, that's, God can set you free from that. That's easy for God. He can do it. The problem is that we stay away. And hide. So take that step to the Lord. Be bold. Say, Lord, I've tried it my way for so long, and it, you know what? It just isn't working. Lord, let me try it your way. Let me connect with you. Holy Spirit, help me. And begin to take a step tonight, even if it's a small one. Then take another one in the evening. Take another one tomorrow, and just keep taking steps, allowing the Father to prune your branch so that you can bear more fruit. And I believe in all of you. And I believe in our church. And I believe that God has a plan for all of our lives. But, but don't allow fear to hold you back thinking, well, man, if I try and God doesn't do it, that's, that's not going to happen. God's going to do it. He didn't give you a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. So let's step in. So just go ahead and stand to your feet. Father, we just praise you. And Father, I ask that you would help us. You said that you went up to heaven, Jesus, to send down your Holy Spirit, who is our helper. Lord, you know the help that each one of us needs individually. You know right where we are in our lives right now. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to take one more step to submission, to surrender. Because Lord, when we do it our own ways, we... We deceive ourselves. Help us to surrender and do it your way. To abide in your love. To connect to that vine. To not hinder the flow of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Holy Spirit, I love you. And I believe that you can touch every life in this place. I ask that you would open minds, you would open hearts, you would open the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf, 
and that you give us fresh revelation that can only come from you. Awaken us to who we could truly be in you. That you are our Heavenly Father and you love us so much. You have a plan. You know all the things that have happened in our past that we are ashamed of. The devil is a liar. And I renounce him right now in the name of Jesus. Don't believe the lies of the devil. Jesus, Jesus came for you while you were in your darkest. When you were a sinner, Christ died for you. He loves you. Just like he saved the Mary Magdalene. And he restored her. He can save all of us. He can restore all of us. Help us to surrender to you, Holy Spirit, every branch, every piece that needs to be pruned. And as we sing this last song, we, we invite you into our lives. Help us to step out of ourselves into your presence. In Jesus' name.